Our job this afternoon, I want to invite Alison Reeve, who is the Climate Change and Energy Program Deputy Director at the Grattan Institute, to come on stage alongside Ron Ben-David, who is a professorial fellow at the Monash University School of Business or Business School. Um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I just do, I'll do a proper introduction. Alison Reeve, you are the Deputy Director of the Climate Change and Energy Program at Grattan. You have a Bachelor of Engineering and a Master's in Public Policy um, from ANU. And uh, Ron Ben David, you're, you've got a qualification in optometry as well as a PhD in economics. Um, I feel like today we've had the battle of the engineers, the economists, and the qualitative researchers. Um, I want to see who wins. Uh, what, are we, what are we missing from the discussion, if anything, today? Or what jumps out at you, I guess, as uh, the things that we really need to focus on going into tomorrow's sessions? but also into the rest of the year and into the next decade. Yeah, Ron, let's start with you. Uh, well, 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 thank you, Rick, for the, the question. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for hanging around uh, so long. I guess that's the benefits of being followed by drinks. But um, <laughs> one observation first. Um, Rob, in the last session, talked about, I can't remember if it was Seville, Madrid, or just Spain in general, being a 27-degree minimum cooling. Do you remember that reference? Can you imagine any politician in this country daring to stand up and say that. You know, the climate wars are just beneath the surface still. And, you know, in Victoria, when the then Premier announced, I think it was the Premier, announced, you know, no new, uh, no new gas um, connections in, in, new, in new developments, <laughs> so no one's being denied anything um, that, they, you know, that they previously had, you know, it, you know, there was this eruption of outrage so imagine 27, I mean, so th that's <laughs> just a framing observation. So I thought very interesting. Um, but what's missing? So, you know, I, I, I used to be a regulator these days. I write a lot and I talk a lot and I carry on a lot about regulation and markets and governance of energy and the energy uh, system and, and um, the, the energy transition. And I'm not an expert in resilience, I'm not an expert in electrification, I'm not an engineer, I'm probably not even a very good economist. <laughs> but what, and I was really a lousy optometrist, <laughs> but, um, but... Um, you were my optometrist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't been... No, you're, no, no you're, you're, you're not old enough, Rick. Um, but, uh, you know, what I think about is how does all of this happen within the, um, the regulatory legal... Uh, frameworks, governance, market-based frameworks we have in place today and that have been in place for, you know, uh, 25 or so years. Um, and I don't see the pathway forward. I can't see the direction in which our regulatory market and governance systems are taking us. And let me jump to the end point of that argument, because I don't have time to go through it in detail. What all of that does, markets, regulation, governance, what all of that does is it allocates risk, it allocates costs across, and it allocates co sort of compens or it allows compensation across the energy system from consumer through to uh, final, uh, to producer of the various services. And when the NEM was set up in, in, in 1998 and in early 2000s, it was very clear what was the system of regulation markets governance was trying to do in terms of delivering an outcome. Now, whether the theories were right, whether the implementation were right, whether the methodologies were right, we can debate that forever. But there was at least a very clear picture of what, the, what I call the reformers were trying to do. Today, I can't see that clarity. And I think one of the most important things that Energy Consumer Australia, everybody in this room, can help contribute is a discussion around a few key, key questions. Because unless we answer those questions, we're kind of running blind in terms of markets, governance and regulation. So the key question, and the rest are subsidiary, but the key question is, who should pay for what? 
Because on the one hand, we hear, oh, we want people to be rewarded for particular behaviours. But if they're being rewarded, someone else is funding that reward. Right? So who should pay for what? Then the subsidiary questions are who should be paid for what? Um, who should pay who for what? <laughs> how much should they pay? And how should they pay? Uh, sorry, and how should they pay? Meaning, by what sort of pricing mechanisms do we want to put in place? So we hear, we heard. I'll stop talking in a sec, Rick. Yep. But we, 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 <laughs> now we've heard a lot today about you know lowest cost you know energy system, um, you know reducing the cost. But the reality is, as was raised in the last panel session about reliability, everyone experiences reliability different. So you have these overarching averages, but no one's actually at the average. Um, the same with prices. We might lower the average cost of the system, the average price, but people are going to, under the current rules, people will experience that very, very differently. And those who are um, you know, sort of copying the, the rough end of that, that pineapple <laughs> are not going to be happy. As, as a Queenslander, I can relate to can the, relate. the pineapple. Um, and so, the, the, you know, the, the big part that the big failure of sort of my community of, you know, regulators and policy people and market designers and that sort of lot um, is they kind of abstract away the political economy of this, of this problem that we're challenging. If you left it to us, it'll all be fine. But it just doesn't work that way. And as I've said to a couple of people sort of in the breaks today, people prefer to complain than shop around. Right? Yeah, we keep telling them to shop around. Right? So, you know, maybe I'll stop. Give well, Alison I'll, a go. I'll come back to you because I do want to unpack some of that. But I do want to bring Alison in here as well because, I mean, that was, a, a, I would say, as a cynical person, quite a realistic picture, but also a very sad and upsetting one. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm, uh, Alison, are you, I mean, I know you spend time thinking about these things and you've done research about it. I mean, what is it, I mean, is there a, a, a glimmer of light in this story about bringing people on board in the transition and, and how do we nudge that behaviour, I guess? I think it's interesting that the, and I, I mean, I think Ron is right in that we do have to think about who pays, but one of the interesting things about the exercise we did this morning when we looked at all those different households is for a lot of people that who pays question is quite complex. It is not just about them. It is about a broader thing of, you know, who in the community is left behind, um, you know, who in the in the community is helped and, and that sort of thing. And I'm not sure that our, our current market design, I think, tends to assume that everyone is a single, you know, atomised actor um, and that, that they don't have those feelings <laughs> effectively towards, towards other actors within the market, that they're just there for their own selfish self-interest. So I think one of the challenges for market designers is how we get a much better idea of how to incorporate how people really feel and think into this market. One of the things I think is really interesting is that I think that some of the big, um, some of the energy retailers are a long way ahead on behavioural economics because that's actually what marketing is, right? That they, they know how to use all of that, how do people actually behave in order to get them, you know, in the door, signed up and all of that sort of stuff. And so some of the challenge here is that, well, how do, how do we get all that going in the direction, in the uh, well, you know, the right direction. Whatever you think the the right direction is, because um, human, humans are not nearly as rational as the traditional econ economists would have us. Look, can believe. I can I give you an example? Yes, I have worked in energy for 20, nearly twenty five years. Right, I have been in lots of roles in that time where I tell people, look at your energy bill. How much are you paying? Shop around. The energy bill that I got in September had that thing on it that the AER now requires everyone to have, which says you could be better off on a bit on another plan. I am still on my old plan. Yes. <laughs> I have not got around to it, right? And I fully intend to do it. And I tried doing it, and then it was like you had to do this online, and then I couldn't remember my login, and then my login didn't work, and then I was like, this is boring. I'm gonna go and do something else, right? 
And inertia is a powerful force. It, it absolutely is, and there are many, many, many more interesting things to do. <laughs> um, Our reflections like, panel is going well. Um, yeah. <laughs> basically, we're saying, don't, this is boring, don't listen, don't listen no, but, to us. I mean, I, I think just I, there's one other thing I was reflecting on a lot today, and I go to a lot of energy industry events, and the people who are in this room are a much more diverse cross-section of people than you typically see at those events. There are more women here, there are more people from culturally diverse backgrounds, there are more younger people, there are more older people. And this is potentially, I think, part of the problem that we, that diversity of, of people and diversity of thought is not finding its way up into the decision-making structures. So I guess a challenge for you all to think about, maybe for, t for tomorrow, is how do you get that to happen? Um, and I don't necessarily mean that an outcome of this is to, to say that, you know, we need a diversity strategy for um, the management of the market bodies or something, but it's more like how do you get the alignment between that incredible diversity of views and the people who are making decisions at the top? And I think this sort of comes to the political economy thing as well, really, that we've got heaps of things in this room that we want as consumers. How are we going to line that up so that the politicians who are in charge of this stuff go, it is absolutely in my selfish political self-interest to make that thing happen. Because this is going to sound really terrible and I'm really sorry, but <laughs> they act, they, there aren't enough vulnerable people for them to care deeply about vulnerable people in a political sense. Oh, yeah. right? There would be... You know, that I'm sure there are plenty of politicians who on a personal level went into politics because they wanted to make things better. But just from a perspective of how you win the media cycle, win question time, win the week, win the election, there just are not enough of those people for them to enter into the political calculus. And we need to come up with a way to make all of... If we want this in, incredible little utopia that we've been talking about today... If that's what you want, you need to come up with a way to make that absolutely in the political interests of politicians for that to happen. I and a, we're not getting there. Uh, I'm not 100%. I don't have a solution for you 100%, but I think we need to start thinking a bit about that. I, I have a solution, and I'm, Ron, I want to get your response to it. I have just moved back two years ago to regional Queensland. I live in a normal traditional street where people mow their lawns, um, and it's like a yawn when one person gets their lawnmower out, everyone in the street does it. Um, when someone gets a new battery installed, people are talking about it. Find the guy with the house on that every street or the, or the family and give them the equipment they need and then get them to influence the neighbours. Um, is there a strategy there of kind of like the Instagram influencer of going after people uh, to convert their neighbours in that organic sense, people they trust or envy? <laughs> I know that sounds... I am mostly joking, but I also think there is something in that. No, I don't think there yeah. is no, no you, you're talking to someone who... I wouldn't even know how to use Instagram. Um, <laughs> I think you'd be very good at it. <laughs> oh, LinkedIn's as far as I go. Um, I'm going to sort of answer, but slightly indirectly, if that's OK, because I don't, I don't know the answer. I, yeah. But, I, again, I think about it through the world I occupy which is, you know, regulation. And I was having a chat earlier in the week to some people from, I'll just say the regulatory community, I won't be specific, frustrated that why do we keep producing the same reports? You know, the market's not working for consumers, therefore consumers have to shop around. We need more retailers, we need more offers, we need to give better information, we need to encourage switching. We've been producing those reports for well, at least since 2007, but probably even earlier, right? So let's say 20 years, let's round it up, 20 years. And we keep coming up with the same uh, responses to dissatisfying outcomes. So what I've been, I've been thinking about this quite a lot, and I've been writing a bit about this lately, which is it's because that is the only outcome of our current way of thinking about these problems. We have to... We have to rethink how we think. Because if we don't, we're going to keep coming up with the same answers to uh, you know, the challenges that keep but jumping up. But all of those things are true, are they not? Have we just not done it? We've, we, don't, we complain about the system, but it's still the same system. So, so a couple of things that um, I, you know, I, I 
I disagreed with and a couple of things I agreed with that Louise said earlier this morning, you know, in her opening remarks. And one of them is that if the market's not working for consumers, particularly after 20 years, then it's the market that needs to be re-examined, not just keep telling consumers the same thing. So we've got to re-examine the way we think about <coughs> not just how... It, you know, so, you know, we talk about customers participating in the market. Really? Right? Really? Is that the way most people think about themselves as, you know, I'm a market participant? No, I just want to switch on my lights and my, you know, my heating and whatever. Um, I just want to use but, my stuff, yeah. But, um, but what I agree with Louise is at some point we have to go back and re-examine. She was saying, well, the market design. I'd say it's, we have to go even further back. We have to go back and really think about how we think about these things. Now, if part of that is creating a system that works by influences, <laughs> let's find the rationale for that approach. Um, I, I, but, I, I, but in the current regime, yeah, we can talk about let's, let's pay some influences to do stuff. Meh, you know. Um, you know will it make a difference? I, yeah, maybe a little, but I do, it's, it's I not mean, systemic. I do think there is a part of Australia that is motivated by what other people have. Um, but I don't know. It's about trust, right, Alison? Like, it's about, you know, when people are told that this is good for you, even when it actually is, they are often not inclined to believe that. And so I, I guess it's that trusted source of information. But again, is that... Am I getting the cart before the horse? Uh, I, I think someone pointed out on one of the panels today that trusted sources, or maybe just in discussions, I can't remember, trusted sources are different for everybody, so there's not one single, you know, if we are talking about one-stop shops or trusted sources or whatever, there's actually not one single one. And I think, as a, a, a lot of people might know, I worked in the public service for 13 years, right? And when you're in there, the, the way of thinking is that you will have one thing, one mm. policy, one, you know, one problem, one policy, one one-stop mm. shop. And what has been really obvious today is that 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 doesn't work. There is no one message. There is no, you know, one magical tweak that we do. And it's actually quite hard for, and I, I guess this goes to examining the way that you were taught to think. It's quite hard for policymakers to get their head around that because the way that they were taught to think was one problem, one policy, right? One problem, one intervention. And that worked really well with a lot of the stuff that governments used to have to deal with, like, say, communicable diseases, right? You know, one measles virus, one measles vaccine, you're mm -hmm. done, right? It is not working well across many policy areas now where you have diverse and complicated problems because those are the ones we now have to deal with. We've done the easy stuff. Um, and so I think... You know, if influencers might be part of it. Um, I feel like everyone took me far more seriously on yeah. that than I intended. <laughs> but I, was, I guess I was trying to make a very oblique point about, you know, yep. there are people... Like, my mum is Anne, basically. The case study Anne is my mum, basically. <laughs> and she would not even necessarily trust a local government council... Um, mm, source. Yep. In fact, she would definitely not trust them. <laughs> yep. uh, and so, and but she would look at what her neighbours doing and be like, "Oh, they've got this battery." And if I'd suggested it because I'd read a report, she would have been like, "Well, uh, um, <laughs> you, you've gone to the university. What are you doing?" So, like, but, it's about finding organic. Yeah, ways it of is. Doing that. And I think one of the things we have to grapple with is that that stuff doesn't scale very easily. Um, you can't just throw a couple of million bucks at it and be done. It's sort of, because it's so diverse and because it is person to person, it takes time. But one of the things that I've actually found quite heartening in probably about the last three to four years, I think, is that people who work in and around energy policy are actually starting to understand the S-curve of uptake much better because we only have to get enough influence to start kicking up that S-curve and it will get its own it will get its own momentum, right? That was what happened when you got a smartphone. You probably got a smartphone because one of your friends got one. Did you not? Yep. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there, there were a very, very early group of people who got them because they were the equivalent of the old guy who loves techie stuff. Um, 
I remember and when my friend's family in the year yeah. 2000 got a digital camera that was like one megapixel. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like everything was taken on a potato, but they loved it. Yeah, my dad had one of those and yeah. he used to have to put a floppy disk in it. Oh, yeah, to get we had the that at high school. Yeah. Took, yep, couldn't see anything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's as long as you can get enough influence through enough trusted sources to start kicking up that S curve, then, yeah, sure, you will, you will get to places. The, the role of regulation is, industri- is interesting here, though, because the way that I think of it is that if it's all working well, what you do is you get enough sort of um, grassrootsy sort of action to get yourself up to a particular level, and that what, what you want is for regulation to come in behind that and put a chalk behind it so that if everyone drops that ball, it doesn't roll all the way to the bottom of the hill again. It only drops a little bit. And then you let more you know, grassroots or, nat- you know, natural growth or whatever to pick it up and then you put your shock in. And we're actually not very good at that either. I don't think we're very good at getting our... Thinking of our... We, you know, we, we often think about, oh, our regulation has to keep up with things, but it needs to keep up with it in this really dynamic way of making sure that if everyone stopped doing the stuff that we've persuaded them to do through tariffs or information or whatever else it is, if everyone just dropped the ball on that, would regulation help us to stop from, from falling all the way back to the bottom? I think that's another thing that we've got to get better at as well. It's like putting a seat halfway up the mountain for people like me when they're on a bushwalk. Um, I'll, I want to get your very quick response to that, Ron, because yeah, I, yeah, we I are out of time, but yeah, I want... I appreciate it. Um, so one of the things that concerns me that I think about a lot is, you know, we... we, t- we, we, you know, we Go back to my previous comment about, you know, because we, this is all done through market mechanisms, market, the thing about markets is they cannibalise themselves. If someone has an advantage, if someone has an opportunity in a market sense, that and other people start copying. This is so, this, this goes back to the street example where everyone starts copying each other. Mimetic desire, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the benefit that the first person got is slowly eroded as more and more people uh, come on. And that's going to be, tr- that, that will be true with, you know, batteries will be true with, you know, PV. All these things, the benefits that people get at the start will not be the same as the benefits they get, if any, at the end. And um, my concern is that we are treating people like sophisticated market operators making investments in assets, tens of thousands of dollars worth of assets, based on what they think they are going to get, because it's based on what they can get now. It won't last. It cannot last in the current system, because it is a market-based system. Markets erode opportunities. They cannibalise opportunities. And that doesn't mean people are stupid. No. It just means they're human. It means they're a lot like oh, me. Not, no, no, it's not. The, I'm not <laughs> that's the last thing I'm suggesting that yeah. people are stupid. Um, it's just they're people, for God's mm-hmm. sake. They're not market traders. I think that's a really important point to remember going in tomorrow, that we are not rational. I'm not rational. I hear the pokey sounds and I want to play them like I still do. Um, I'm not advocating that, by the way, given I know that you're in the gambling. <laughs> I regulate <laughs> yes. pokies in Victoria. Um, and we thank you for your service. Uh, <laughs>